and by um, a sensor operator who manually observes and processes the data. And then, um, and that's really inefficient because all of the different sensor operators are scattered throughout and they have to then communicate what they're seeing back to a central location. So instead of that, um, what the Navy wants to do is to stream all of that data into a centralized location, um, what they call the Tactical Support Center. And in that centralized location, they want to have a single operator be able to monitor all of the different streams at once so that in, at a single point, at a single location, you can have a more globalized view of what is going on around you. So why does that pose a problem? When you have a single operator monitoring mo multiple sensor streams at once, um, it can easily lead to fatigue, to attention overload, and, um, and the, quality of their, the quality that they're performing their jobs will start to uh, decrease. And this is where expat steps in, and we automatically process each of these streams um, for important events such as you know, ships being detected, and then we will cue the operator to look at particular streams that we find to have more important um, events going on. So a system overview of the expat system. Uh, as you can see here, these, these clouds, they represent the different uh, parallel streams of data being fed into expats. And each recognition engine here um, is, our, is our central computer vision processing unit. And then the results of each, um, after it's been um, you know, processed for any ships detected, what the classification of the ships are, then gets fed into what we call a correlation module that essentially just aggregates all the data. And then a prioritization module um, will you know, figure out which streams are more important than others and thus be able to guide the sensor operator um, towards the more important streams. So back to the recognition engine, which I said was our um, main computer vision module. So a couple of things happen inside the recognition engine. We have here our general object detector module. This you know, processes each frame for, um, for objects. Uh, it doesn't discriminate between, uh, I'm only looking for a certain type of object. It just looks for like what are some what are interesting things? What are activities currently happening in the frame? And then our contact recognizer here. This is the module that um, we actually are employing deep learning to classify the frame. And then the tracking module kind of takes the output of the object detector and the contact recognizer to keep track of just the different objects detected uh, throughout the frames in a video. So now to the deep learning part. Um, we are using uh, deep learning, specifically CNN, convolutional neural networks, uh, to perform ship classification in the contact recognizer. And the ship classification is performed at the frame level, and we classify each frame into one of the following six classes. So open water, it's um, just what it sounds like, open water, and that's something we deem as not very interesting. Uh, warship and speedboat, um, these are the more interesting, more important uh, objects that the operator would be alerted about. And then we have sailboat, merchant ship, cruise ship, just other types of um, ships you would normally see out in the sea. So how do we train our deep learning model? So for our particular application, real data is pretty hard and expensive to acquire. So what we had to do was resort to open source, um, publicly available uh, image databases. So we used Flickr, and um, we searched for you know, each of the six 
uh, classes that we were interested in on Flickr, and we acquired a uh, a total data set of about 300, 3,000, sorry, 3,000 images, which we divided up into a little over 2,000 for training, um, and then roughly 450 each for validation and testing. So implementation-wise, we use um, the open source framework called CAFE for doing both the training and the classification. And uh, like I said before, we gathered about 3,000 images. So due to the small number of training images we had, uh, what we did was we used image, the ImageNet data set, which is a data set of over a million images to initialize our initial uh, neural network. Um, and then apply the parameters learned from that neural network on our, um, as a starting point for our training process. So here I've, in I've included a lot of the different parameters that we use for training our CNN, which I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, um, but like you've seen in other presentations before mine, we also used a AlexNet. Um, so with five convolutional layers and then three fully connect connected layers. So the results on the Flickr data set, um, the first row you see are the correct classifications. Uh, the second row you'll see uh, um, some sample images of where our model didn't do so well. Um, so it actually performed very well on a wide variety of images and um, mainly it struggled when the ship resolution was low, so the ship was very small in the frame, or um, you know, when we threw at it something that it's never seen before, so like the middle image where you see a whale tail um, flicking up. Yeah, so, um, so those were the main, um, main types of images that it didn't do so well on. So for the actual quantitative results, um, this is the confusion matrix um, for our test result over our 450, roughly 450 images. Um, so the diagonal represents the correct classification and um, the rest of the matrix represents incorrectly classified um, results. So as you can see, uh, over all six classes that we wanted to train the, uh, the model on, it performed very well, um, above 86% for all six, all six classes, and a overall classification rate of roughly 91%. Uh, and now a little bit about our training set size. So like I said before, uh, for our application, it's very expensive and very hard to acquire um, real data and the size of our training data is typically very small compared to what you would normally um, expect when you're training a deep learning model. So we then investigated, well, how small of a training data set can we get away with and still have a adequately performing model? So we conducted an experiment where we trained the trained the model using, um, on the low end, just 10 training images, which for us, having six classes meant less than two images per class, to on the high end, for us high end, um, of 2,000 images, where um, it's roughly 300, 300 images per class. And we performed five trials for each training set size. And for each training set, um, we also you know, first pre-trained it using the ImageNet and then fed it the additional ship, um, ship specific training data that we had. So this graph shows the average classification results we were able to get over the varying number of training images. So as you can see, um, with only 10 training images, so again, that's less than two images per class, um, it still performs surprisingly well, um, you know, a little over 50% uh, classification accuracy compared to the majority class baseline of just 19%. Um, and that number actually rises pretty quickly as we increase the number of training images. So 
um, this shows that using transfer learning and using a image, um, a deep learning neural network that's initialized first on ImageNet uh, worked very well for our practice because um, the learned features were generic enough of a representation of the visual world that they could be easily transferred to our application where we're trying to classify ships. So now the overall system um, results. So this is processing uh, videos of uh, real life videos captured by helicopter over water um, and not the, actual, not the Flickr data. So these are some sample correct classification images. And here are some sample incorrect classification. So again, the quantitative results. Um, as you can see, we did fairly well over a variety of different um, ship types. And to elaborate a little bit more about our results, so seven out of the 11 videos, uh, we had over 80, 80, around 80% 80 correct classification rate. Um, and one thing that we discovered was that the system was actually really good at classifying open water frames, open water images. So we had pretty lengthy videos that we fed in, both um, you know, calm waters and stormy sea conditions, and it had 100% accuracy over, um, over both, uh, both types of videos. And this was uh, really good for us because as a system that cues operators for when important things happen, uh, we really want to lower that uh, false positive rate. So if we know um, through classification that a frame is just open water, we can easily um, not, we can easily just not, uh, not cue the operator on something that they don't need to pay attention to. So in conclusion, we designed a system to automatically detect and classify ships in maritime scene. We found that uh, using CNN was very applicable and useful for us in our application. And um, we found that you know, not only were we able to build a system that could cue operators in real time about important events, um, we are also able to then you know, tag the video um, such that when they want to play the video back and replay, um, we can easily help them skip over any uninteresting segments such as just open water and really save them a lot of human hours. So future work, um, this is an ongoing project still, and um, we're working with the Navy to acquire more data because I think that's one, um, that's one thing that could really help improve the results of the system if we have more data to train the system on, and um, not just Flickr data, but you know, real, real life data that's more similar to when the system will be deployed. Um, we also want to train more Sienna models. So currently we have you know, six generic classes, um, but we would like to see how CNN would perform if we, uh, if we tasked it to distinguish, say, between different warships and not just between different generic ship classes. Um, and we also want to apply CNN-based approaches to not only doing classification, uh, but detection as well, so that um, we can use CNN to tell us oh, where the interesting, um, interesting activity is going on. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. OK. We can go there. You have time for one question, you know. <laughs> so did you have to use the uh, negative example in the data sets? And if any, is this a re the ratio between the negative and positive samples? That's a good question. Um, I am actually not too sure my co-author was the one that did a lot of the training. Uh, so I would, I would hold off on answering that because I don't want to say anything that could be wrong or misleading. <laughs>